forward, you move. Uh, How do I move back? With this, with one. this one, okay. And yes. then if you want to. The pants, okay, yeah. I understand. Thank you. Um, okay, so welcome again to everybody. Uh, I think we can start. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Maria Franco Gavonel, uh, our next presenter, and uh, she will talk uh, about the links uh, between uh, uh, migration and uh, susten sustainability. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, good morning. So uh, today I'm going to uh, discuss work that has been uh, developed in collaboration with uh, Professor Neil Adger and Dr. Ricardo Safra de Campos from the University of Exeter uh, in the UK. And uh, this is a collaborative work. So. Uh, before I go uh, through, the, through the outline, just to, to introduce myself a little bit, uh, I have a, a background in economics, but my PhD is in international development. So I normally draw from other social sciences uh, in my work. So today I'm going to present about, uh, well, I'm going to motivate a little bit the talk. Then I will uh, discuss what we call the migration sustainability paradox. Um, I'll explain a little bit about the role of uh, international migration. So throughout this talk, I'm going to discuss mostly about international migration. Uh, and then I'll, I'll show uh, what the empirical evidence that we have uh, on this and, and how we got uh, these results. And I'll go, I'll go into more details. And then I'll conclude. So theories of transformation to sustainability tend to overlook uh, migration despite it reshapes uh, societies and, pol and politics around the world. So by uh, theories of transformation to sustainability, I mean what Ian Schoons calls uh, these uh, different typologies, such as uh, market-led transformations or state-led transformations, technology-led transformations, and citizen-led transformations. So these ones tend to assume static uh, populations and not, do not necessarily incorporate flows uh, across uh, different areas. Uh, whereas, uh, on the other hand, migration transition theories tend to see migration as a catalyst of social transformation. So they basically, uh, the work of Castles, for example, uh, looks at how migration represents a window of opportunity in which people move and tend to change, they not only change their place of residence, but they also uh, then have to adapt. And therefore, that means uh, to put a lot of effort uh, and to change attitudes and behaviors. And this eventually scales up to uh, more aggregate, uh, at the more aggregate level. So current migration trends to consider uh, at the moment are the first one, uh, the globalization of migration. So uh, here, uh, what I mean is basically uh, that there are more and more flows, and these flows are more diverse. So uh, more uh, people from more countries are moving around, and uh, then there is a change in the dominant flows. So, for example, until after the uh, World War, uh, it was mostly Europeans um, uh, moving uh, to the Americas, uh, but then after that, now we are seeing much more uh, south-north movements, like global south to global north movements, and uh, uh, also movement to the Gulf countries. Then we have uh, a diversity of reasons. So it's not only labor migration that is the main flow, uh, 
but also um, we have people, uh, refugees, for example, that run away from uh, conflict. We have um, uh, people that move for family formation and so on, and most, and most of the times these reasons are interlinked. We also see um, a proliferation of the migration transition. So basically areas that before were sources are, uh, and by sources I mean that have a, 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 a net uh, migration rate that is negative, so they have more emigrants than immigrants. Um, they, these places are becoming now more destinations. So where, where it's the, the opposite, they have like a positive net migration rate, which is that uh, immigration is greater than emigration. Um, and in this case, for example, we have Mexico, uh, which is uh, a, a country that uh, in the past it was mostly an emitting country, but nowadays uh, it's also receiving a lot of uh, immigrants because it's basically a transition place where people uh, from Central and South America move to go to the US. But many, um, very often they are stuck there. Um, so then we have the feminization of labor migration which is that in the past it was mostly male people moving, uh, whereas now we have uh, more and more women, and in some cases, women are the majority of the flows. And finally, and more definingly, uh, there is a growing politicization of migration. So it's becoming an, a security issue. Uh, now borders are militarized almost everywhere, and this, this is something that we didn't see uh, as uh, prevalent as before. So, the paradox. So basically what we claim is that migration can have two uh, counteracting uh, effects on sustainability. So on the one hand, it's a, one of the three pillars of globalization. So apart from a free flow of goods and services uh, and capital, we also have a movement of people. So it's one of the three pillars. But uh, that uh, also uh, drive unsustainability. But on the other hand, it's also a potential force for transformative change. As I was mentioning, uh, the work uh, that sees migration as a catalyst uh, of social transformation. So uh, here I just want to clarify some definitions. So as I was mentioning migration, uh, I'm going to focus mainly on international migration. Uh, so this is defined as people, uh, foreign born populations because there are other definitions that take into account nationalities and other things, but in this case, we're going to focus on foreign born. So if someone is foreign born, uh, it's considered a migrant, an international migrant. And then for sustainability, we are uh, looking at the interplay of, of three things, that, which ties nicely with the previous presentation that looked at the three circles uh, of economic, social, and environmental. So, uh, here we are taking the definition of the Brundtland Report. The Brundtland Report, uh, as many of you already know, it's, uh, it was a, a report in, the, in 1987 uh, commissioned by the um, Environment and Development uh, Commission, World Commission, and it was uh, led by, the, by Gro Harlem uh, Brundtland, the then um, Prime Minister of Norway. And he wrote this report where basically he defined sustainable development as the, the uh, already well-known definition that uh, it's the development that uh, meets the needs of current generations without compromising of those of future generations. And, um, but he didn't say that only. He also talked about the interplay of these three systems, of the economic, social, and environmental systems. He was very critical of how uh, countries in the global north were uh, increasingly industrializing and therefore polluting more, and this was affecting uh, countries in the global south. Because, and, and this also ties nicely with the previous presentation, which is basically, it's related to the limits to growth, right? Like uh, how much uh, a country can grow without compromising uh, the environment and even uh, societies. So, um, and, and uh, a third point just to highlight is that Although here I'm, I'm discussing mainly aggregate flows, like flows at the country level, if you, uh, so we also, as part of this project, we made, uh, we undertook a survey among uh, around 6,000 individuals in six cities, and, um, and we asked them how do they define sustainability. 
And, uh, and the result of that survey is that people also perceive that sustainability can be defined across these three dimensions, uh, economic, social, and environmental. So although we tend to talk more about the economic and the environmental, uh, the social aspect, the social cohesion aspect is also uh, really important. So what we propose is then, given that this, uh, taking on board this definition of, of the three dimensions, we, uh, we propose that Micro if migration increases material well-being, reduces inequality, and lowers environmental burden, then uh, we would have uh, an increase on sustainability or like the country would be on track towards a sustainable development uh, path. I will park it there for now, but the, the idea of this project was to test this uh, hypothesis. So uh, just before I go the, to the results and to the methods, uh, I would like just to go through uh, what is the role of migration on each of these dimensions, on these of three uh, dimensions. On the economic dimension, um, immigration contributes to aggregate output in two ways. Directly, in that basically more, uh, more workers mean, means more output. Uh, but also indirectly through innovation and public finances. So basically, through innovation, because uh, having a more diverse workforce uh, spurs innovation. Uh, that's what uh, Stuen and colleagues found. And on the other hand, public finances uh, are uh, benefited from uh, migration inflows because uh, migrants tend to pay more in taxes than what they receive in, in benefits from in state benefits. Uh, so, and these are, of course, very political claims, but that's what uh, Rothorn finds. Um, so then we have the social dimension, which, where the evidence is mixed. So there, there's no settlement on what, uh, which, what's the, re the direction of the relationship. Uh, first, we have um, in, uh, the debate about immigration and social cohesion. So here, the political scientist Patnam, Robert Patnam, uh, argued that uh, in the U.S. the uh, immigration flows or the, the uh, excess amount of immigration flows were deteriorating social cohesion. Uh, and he argued that this also had implications for uh, political and civic participation and so on. Um, whereas on the other hand, uh, Alejandro Portes, uh, who is a sociologist, uh, found that uh, uh, he actually challenged this view and he argued that uh, societies like the U.S. or other developed countries have such strong institutions that it's very difficult for a migration inflow to change them. And because these institutions govern the way in, in which societies interact, then um, immigration does not necessarily uh, deteriorate social cohesion. On the other hand, we have the economists, which uh, uh, also do not, are, are, do not agree uh, on the evidence about this. Uh, so the, the relationship between immigration and wage inequality has been very contested over 30 years of debate. And um, where, for example, David Card in 1990 um, found that the inflow of uh, what he called Marielitos, which was uh, an inflow of Cuban uh, migrants from to, to, the, to Miami. Uh, and th this was the setting uh, in which they, they were trying to analyze whether this inflow, this big inflow of uh, migrants affected uh, wage inequality. So he found that this was not the case, uh, whereas George Borjas uh, contested this and he uh, basically, it was a, a very long debate. It was uh, mostly methodological uh, and how the counterfactual was measured. Like, so basically, if you know that if, when you compare uh, treatment and, if, and control, uh, it really depends which control you are using uh, to see like uh, what the, what's the effect that you find. So uh, in this case, Paul has challenged this, and he said that. Uh, so he he basically said that, it, that there were some adjustments that had to be made, and he found that that uh, this this was uh, the relationship here was uh, negative. The, finally, we have the environmental dimension where there is very limited evidence, although it's also equally political. Um, the, so we say, they, they find that uh, in Liang et al, uh, this study looks at uh, how immigration uh, affects CO2 emissions. It looks at data from all over the world, 
and, uh, and they find that it increases CO2 emissions globally. So basically because they argue that, uh, that sender countries are uh, net exporters of CO2, whereas uh, destination countries are net importers of CO2. However, uh, this, is also, this also has to be balanced with some other studies uh, that find that uh, country uh, so country specific studies basically obtain divergent results. Like it's not uh, all uh, settled as well. Some of them find that there is a, a, an increase and some others find that there is no effect. So now the role of emigration. Now the, the previous slide was mostly about how uh, migration relates to the destination areas, like how the inflow of migrants affects these three uh, dimensions of sustainability, whereas this one looks at more at how, uh, from the source areas, like from the emitting areas. How does emigration uh, affect these three dimensions? So the first one, um, there are two forces that basically uh, affect emigration and economic growth. The first one was posed by Bagwati in the 70s, where uh, he argued that basically there was a brain drain. So there was a loss of talent that uh, had negative externalities on the, at the origin, and therefore uh, more emigration meant uh, less economic growth. So it was detrimental for, the, for, the, uh, for the, the source areas. On the other hand, more recently in the 90s, uh, Mountfort uh, proposed that, the, that actually the prospect of emigrating uh, increases uh, investments on human capital at origin. So if I know that I'm going to migrate tomorrow, today I will study, I will study more years. And therefore this increases the, the stock of human capital and therefore this is um, uh, positive for, uh, for economic growth. Um, now the social dimension here, um, there is my, David McKenzie from the World Bank finds that there is an inverted U relationship between emigration and inequality. And uh, the logic behind this is that normally uh, migration, and especially international migration, is a very costly endeavor. So uh, when households or individuals want to migrate, they have to invest a lot, and therefore not everyone can afford it. So at the beginning, when migration rates are low, um, only relatively wealthier households are able to send uh, migrants. So this increases inequality because then they receive remittances and they are even more, more uh, wealthier. Um, whereas, so this, this is the, the, the positive uh, part of the, of the relationship and then the negative part comes um, when, uh, uh, th when there, there, uh, there are social networks that are increasing and therefore uh, m uh, lower income uh, households start also sending migrants through these networks and then uh, the relationship becomes uh, negative. And then finally, the environmental dimension. Uh, well, here, as I was saying, there is very limited evidence, and I'm going to cite just the same paper as I was citing before, uh, the one from uh, Liang et al., in which they find uh, what I was mentioning, which is that developing regions are generally uh, net exporters of CO2, basically because they are uh, net, net senders of migrants, and uh, and uh, developed regions are actually net importers of, of CO2 because they are destination areas. So the work that we have done, uh, have, we try to operationalize these uh, dimensions, these different dimensions of sustainability. And uh, so we use as proxies for the economic dimension GDP per capita. This is very valuable as we have seen throughout the presentations, but we are still using uh, this as a measure of economic, of the economic dimension. Um, we also are interested in the social dimension, which uh, as a proxy we use uh, income inequality. Uh, the way we are approximating this, this uh, concept is also debatable, but I'll go through, through this in a little while. And finally, the environmental dimension is basically the CO2 per capita. Um, so, and we want to test whether migration affects each of these three simultaneously, or well, the three of these uh, simultaneously. So, we used a multi-country computable general equilibrium model um, developed by uh, the Global Trade Analysis Project. This is a, a project uh, based at Purdue University in the US. 
And um, I understand that there are uh, a lot of uh, limits to general equilibrium models, to CGEs, uh, but still we are uh, going ahead with this, with this method and I'm, I'm happy to discuss uh, in more detail uh, later on. Um, so, so GTAP, as uh, it's, uh, its acronym, uh, has also um, um, uh, has developed also a model specifically for energy to account for energy inputs and outputs, and that's why it's called EGTAP. Um, so we use this model to uh, that that, that uses data from 2019 uh, for 118 countries grouped into nine world regions. These regions are the U.S., EU. Uh, just to note that this is in 2019, so it was still including the UK. Um, Russia and Central Eastern European countries, uh, Japan, other OECD countries that are not included in the previous four uh, uh, groups, net energy exporters, which are basically Gulf countries and some um, countries in Latin America like Venezuela, and even Mexico is there, and I'll show how this affects the results. China, India, and the Global South. The Global South is very diverse, but it was grouped into a single uh, category. And this is something that we are still revising, but uh, that's the way we, we had uh, basically uh, categorized uh, this. So, um, so then we, uh, based on, this, on, the, on these nine categories, we group uh, everything, uh, all, every region into net destinations and net sources. So we look at the net migration rate of each of these regions, and we, uh, and whether it's positive or negative, we see like whether uh, it's a net destination region or, or a net source region. And then we also classify the flows by high skill and low skill migration. So high skill migration is defined as uh, basically the share of, uh, of a graduate college sorry, of college graduates uh, in, uh, in each region, and, uh, and low-skilled a complement of this group. And this was, uh, sorry, and the, the data comes from, uh, the migration flows come from Abel and Cohen, uh, and uh, the, the share of uh, high-skilled migration comes from the Kier and Rappaport. So this is, uh, the, these are the net migration rates between 1990 and 2020. They, this uh, just have mostly fluctuated uh, for uh, other OECD countries and for the U.S. <clears throat> it, it, they have follow a downward uh, trend since uh, 2005. And then we can see that uh, there is a big difference between these two regions and the rest of the other regions, which mostly fluctuate around zero. Um, so still, but still, uh, it's possible to disentangle like who is a net destination and who is a net a net source. So the main migration flows. In this exercise, we wanted to focus on the on the main migration flows. So on the on the largest flows for each destination and for each source. Um, on the left column, we have the re the nine regions where uh, in blue font we find the all the net destinations. And uh, in red font, uh, those are that, that are net sources and net energy exporters, which are uh, fluctuating around zero. So they, 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 they were partly uh, both. Uh, so, uh, for, so for example, for the case of the US, the top source comes uh, from Mexico, so it comes from the net energy exporters. Uh, in the, uh, and by the way, this table was uh, uh, developed taking into account interregional migration. So we don't account, for example, moves within the, Euro the EU, which are actually the most uh, prevalent uh, type of flows. So we have uh, that from the EU, for the EU, Japan, and the net energy exporters, the Global South is the main um, uh, source. Uh, for other OECD countries, uh, it's the EU. And then on the, la on the third column, we have, uh, uh, the, 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 with the, following the same logic, we have the top destinations for the net sources, so for all the ones that are in red font. So we have that the top source for, the, for Russian CE uh, is the EU, uh, for China is the Global South, uh, uh, and so forth, uh, for India and the Global South for uh, the net energy exporters. 
So this is basically the table the, of inputs that we um, use to go through uh, the simulations. Uh, and uh, these are changes with, uh, the first panel shows the changes with respect to the labor force, whereas uh, the second panel cho uh, shows the changes with respect to the population. And uh, the, just the, the use of these two is basically because the model uh, require is, is adjusted per capita, so we, it requires uh, population shares as well as labor force shares, which are reflecting the migration flows. So none of these, uh, the range is very low. Um, it, it goes from, uh, for the positive numbers, so it goes from uh, 0.32 to maximum 5%. Um, and uh, similarly for the negative ones, uh, from minus 4% to uh, minus 0.06%. So from this, so for, okay, I didn't mention the most important thing. We had four, four scenarios. So uh, we created the net destination high skilled, uh, net destination unskilled, net source skilled, and net source unskilled. So for, this, for each of these scenarios, uh, we, simulate, we did these simulations. So each column basically reflects uh, a, single, a single scenario. Um, and these are the results for the, for the first one. So for the uh, net destination and high skilled, we find that, uh, for example, in the case of the US, there is a, a 0.7 uh, percentage uh, increase in GDP per capita as a result of these flows. Um, now, the way in which we are interpreting uh, this uh, income inequality that I was mentioning before it's actually, uh, so it's, it, it looks at basically factor prices. So for, for high and low skilled labor, we are looking at high and low skilled um, uh, wages. Whereas, uh, and price of capital. So in the case of the US, for example, we see that an increase in, in high skill migration leads to a reduction in, in, in skill, uh, in the wages of, uh, of skilled labor because Basically, uh, more skilled people means that uh, there's a shift in supply and therefore um, uh, wages go down. Um, uh, and then we have uh, the, the opposite effect for the unskilled wages and for uh, the price of capital, assuming that there is some level of substitutability between um, uh, high, high skilled labor and capital. And finally, in the third uh, graph, we are looking at um, the, the percentage change in CO2 per capita, which is also uh, great. So it's greater, for example, in the case of the US and the Global South, because the US is a, a net destination, you are seeing that uh, the CO2 per capita moves together with the GDP per capita. So basically more production means more CO2, um, whereas in the global, uh, Many of the of these flows are netted out, uh, not netted out, but are uh, reflected on the flow on the in source uh, areas like the global south, uh, where this is actually a negative uh, result. Again, uh, a negative result on GDP uh, correlates with a negative result on CO2 per capita. And I'll discuss this a little bit, in, like the limitations of this, in in a little bit more detail, but. Uh, GDP and CO2 do not necessarily have to correlate, uh, or at least positively. Um, but this is something; this, it's part of the of the of the, the inner workings of the of the model. So we have similar uh, graphs for each scenario, and I just want to show you the uh, the final the the summary of the of the results. So basically, um, in this for each scenario, we have grouped the results for uh, GDP inequality and CO2. Uh, in the top left quadrant, we have high skilled net destination where we have an increase in GDP and also an increase in CO2, but a reduction in inequality because as we saw uh, that in the distribution of income, if we have an increase in wages of high skilled uh, people, uh, so it, 
there is a decrease in the, in the wages of high-skilled people and an increase in the wages of low-skilled people, then we have a compression of the distribution and therefore we have less inequality. So that's the way that we are inferring this. We are not using the guinea or tail or other measures of inequality because the model does not allow for that. But, uh, but we can infer this uh, from, the from, the changes in from the direction of the changes in which um, the wages and the price of capital move, uh, move forward. So then we have the low-skilled net destination uh, where, we have, uh, where the three elements uh, go up, uh, GDP, inequality, and, and CO2. And then when we look at the high skill net source, we have a reduction in GDP, an increase in inequality, but a, a decrease in CO2. So this, this is uh, basically uh, the, the result of having, of uh, getting rid of labor, and therefore uh, you, you lose output. So then you have a, a decline in GDP, and, and thus a decline in CO2. However, when doing sensitivity analysis, what we found is that so in, in, in any of these scenarios, the three dimensions move uh, in a posit like normatively positive way. Like there's no increase in GDP, reduction in inequality, or, and reduction in, in CO2 at the same time in any of these four scenarios. And therefore, the answer, the blunt answer for the, for the hypothesis would be like, we don't find this. Uh, however, what we find doing sensitivity analysis is that uh, for, the top, uh, for the top left quadrant, we uh, found that there, if the, uh, so it's, the parameter is the elasticity of substitution between capital and energy. So this basically reflects how easy it is to substitute uh, or how linked uh, are capital and uh, energy inputs. So the higher the dependence between these two, um, the, the, the worse it's going to be for the effect on CO2. Whereas uh, if, you, if this become, uh, sorry, the, the more substitutable they are, the, the better it is for CO2 reductions, whereas uh, the, the lower, the more complements they are, um, the, the higher is the increase in CO2. Uh, so what, this is what we, ca what we call the potentially sustainable scenario and how this parameter is changed is actually a very challenging uh, thing because uh, it basically depends on the structure of the economy and how uh, it's not something that can be just, so it's basically it, it implies uh, uh, green technologies and uh, machines depending less and less on energy inputs. So it becomes, it requires a transition. So just to conclude, so migration has the potential to change these three dimensions, not simultaneously, just potentially, because this, pot and this potential uh, depends on two things. The first one is the selectivity of migrants and what we are uh, uh, here just uh, discussing about uh, education but this need not to be the, the only dimension that is taken into account. Migrants are more heterogeneous in various different ways. Um, and also the post-migration conditions. So like, for example, the structure of the economy, like whether uh, it's, it's a green air economy or, or not, this is going to affect whether the CO2 goes up or down. And that's that, thank you. Thank you, and uh, now it's time for questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. I am a bit puzzled by one thing, though. Uh, you, you've spent the first half of it telling us about flows and highly complex flows, and then you told us you were using a general equilibrium model, when actually all these flows make me think of an strongly out of equilibrium system. What do you have to say about this? Could you elaborate further? Well, when you have flows and complex flows, you expect long relaxation times to equilibrium. And so, no, I, I wouldn't go for a general equilibrium model 
Yeah, okay, I agree. So just like this was discussed in previous days, uh, there, I mean, the general equilibrium models have a lot of flaws. They actually as, uh, assume many things, uh, and frictions are one of those, uh, that there are no frictions. So uh, I agree that a general equilibrium model uh, is limited uh, to some extent, and I think that uh, actually having into account, taking into account this, uh, all the, the situations in which migration in particular affects these type of things like the lags or, or the, um, uh, for example, the fact that uh, there it, this also assumes uh, competitive markets, which are not necessarily the case for labor markets and especially for uh, labor markets in which mi migrants work. Uh, so yes, I completely agree. Uh, it may not necessarily be the most ideal, but this is like just a first step towards that. But thank you. Well, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. I want to uh, make one observation regarding the penultimate um, slide that you showed. That's it. The, the GDP inequality CO2 combination and this puzzling. And I wonder whether the following observation might help in interpreting the findings that you have. The disappointing um, in, uh, findings that you have, disappointing so in the ethical sense. Yeah. So Managi and Kumar in their uh, cross-country estimates of inclusive wealth uh, had one finding which I think is quite in very interesting. Uh, it wasn't exclusively CO2, it was natural capital, but CO2 was such an important part of that in their compute, so let's just ignore that. So the idea was the footprint, um, ecological footprint, of which CO2 is a major component, and GDP is related monotonically uh, across 160 countries in their sample, I guess. Um, but the the curve, the functional relationship between GDP and footprint, a footprint and GDP, uh, was concave, strictly concave, sort of bending like that, okay. which has a uh, peculiar, well, it has a the following implication that any redistribution, egalitarian redistribution, increases the global, uh, the total footprint. So the idea, of course, the rich are polluting more than the poor, but at the margin, the rich pollute less than the, than the poor does at the margin. That's the concavity assumption, which means that inequality reduction moves or would need to be compensated by a decline in average GDP if the footprint is, the, the aggregate footprint is to be kept fixed. So that's the sort of a, um, it was to me a disappointing result again I mean, I was hoping it would be convex, then of course <laughs> our conventional notions would all be going together. But that's how life is, at least that's what the data say. And I wonder if you want to use that to see. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I think that uh, there is a still a lot more space for improving this uh, exercise. We're still revising some, some of the things, but the, this uh, uh, pointing to, to this study is quite helpful. Uh, and uh, which reminds me actually to something else that, uh, that is related to the limits to growth, uh, which is that, uh, it, and it's the distributional impacts of it. Like exactly what you mentioned, that, it, that when we compare um, developed countries with developing countries and who pollutes more, uh, there is, it's not that straightforward to just cap growth for everyone. Uh, but, uh, but maybe at the top end of the distribution, uh, and also uh, to take into account the fact that, uh, that if we want the developing countries to actually transition towards a greener economy, there has to be some sort of redistribution there that from the developed countries in order to, to enable this type of uh, transition. Yes. Oh, Hi there. Sorry. Oh, should I go? Hi, Maria. Thank you. Very interesting talk, very important subject. Um, I was wondering, you know, in the last few years with COVID, but also with, with the kind of politics we've been having in parts of Europe and the United States, there have been a decrease, I think we saw, maybe we saw in your plot, uh, of international migration incoming. 
I think your results would show from the point of view of the, in, uh, the recipient country that there are advantages, CO, CO2 aside from, from receiving migrants. There's a long history of documenting that. But I wonder if using your methods or others, you could estimate the opportunity cost of reduced migration that we're experiencing at the moment in, in these destinations. Mm. Okay, so we, we are not looking at uh, reductions. Um, let me just check, no, okay, I see. That might change the, the landscape. We haven't actually considered that, but uh, yeah, I suppose that that could be an, an interesting avenue for, for, for exploring. Uh, with COVID, this data, although it says uh, that it's from 2021, it actually considers up until June 2020. So it does explain partly why there's also a, a, a decrease in, in the 2015, 2020 period. Um, so, so it would be a matter of updating this uh, in the next few years and see how it, uh, it goes and what, it, what happens with, uh, uh, with, the, with the current situation where we are still not fully over COVID but uh, yeah, uh, it, it would be a matter of, of, of taking this into account. Sorry, uh, uh, slightly related to this. So um, my uh, question is whether um, um, this is the right exercise in the sense that, uh, well, in the end, one is trying to say, describe what happens in in a particular scenario, but uh, then, uh, of course, there are a lot of issues with general equilibrium, with other assumptions, et cetera, et cetera. So, would it, it make more sense uh, to pose a different problem? So, given this scenario, given general equilibrium, given uh, CO2, taking CO2 as, what is the best, what is the optimum? What is the optimal uh, thing that an economy, because essentially in the end, uh, uh, and what is, the, what is the optimal, what does the optimal strategy look like? Because in the end, uh, probably you want to make a suggestion for policy and uh, for uh, uh, um, uh, for institution to be created to manage migrations, and with, which is essentially something that is completely lacking at the, at the moment. No? So, and of course, maybe one could also estimate, as Luis was suggesting, uh, what would be the benefit for society of what could be the benefit with all these limitations of, uh, 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 say, managing migrations uh, for both the environment and, and for the economy and for the social. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Uh, so I think that if you wanted to uh, go to the, to the potential benefits uh, of, of migration, I, okay, first of all... problem here. I mean, in this uh, setting, I mean, there is an optimization problem, which is probably the wrong one. I mean, the, in GTAP, there is, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a general equilibrium, so there is an optimization problem. Probably is the, is the wrong problem. Well, this is my question. It's a wrong? It's the wrong problem. The wrong problem. Okay, so sorry, one should sorry. look at a okay, different optimization problem. Okay, I see. Uh, uh, Okay, so just to say that given that this particular type of modeling has a, I mean, I don't want to take the results at face value and derive any policy from uh, as it is at the moment. Because uh, f uh, first of all, there's one element that we are not taking into account, which is one limitation of this exercise, which is uh, the, the remittances flow. Uh, these, the remittances flow can alter uh, GDP, there are, there's an increasing amount of, of remittances uh, being sent from developed countries to developing countries that, that although, okay, there's a whole discussion about whether at the macro level you actually see a, 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 a positive correlation between remittances and GDP. There is, 
at the individual level, there is a lot of uh, st studies that find that there is a, a positive uh, relationship between the two, between uh, remittances and, and household income. So this could actually talk to this scenario, actually, to the, to the uh, bottom uh, right, where uh, it, w it could increase GDP. So it's not, I would, as it is, I wouldn't want to, to propose any policy or to be in favor or against any migration policy just to say like migration doesn't contribute to sustainability and, and, and that's uh, it. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I agree that this is something that, that we should eventually take into account. Um, now the potential benefits, it would be, I, the way I see it is that it would depend on the weights that you assign to each dimension, because if a, in a, each country is a whole world. So if you want to, for example, uh, if, you're, if inequality is your, your worst or your, your key issue, then you might be happy uh, being in, other, in, in, in any other of the uh, quadrants, as long as it increases it. So it's a slightly context specific as well. Uh, and and that, that would be a way to, to in a sense, save these uh, disappointing results <laughs> because migration do not necessarily address the three of them simultaneously in a better way. Thank you. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions. The first is that on this schematic, every time GDP goes up, CO2 goes up. And with technological advances, that's not necessarily the case. Conflating the two of them is dangerous because it will make countries less ready to do things that are increasing sustainability. So my first question is how do you answer that or factor it into your models better? My second question is a question of scale. So I spent most of nine years living in China and China is an interesting place because domestically you have rural urban migration. You have people who've grown up in the countryside providing labor in cities. But within rural environments, you have net migration from neighboring countries for low-skilled agricultural pickers, et cetera. So with countries that have that kind of dynamics, how do you figure those into your models? Or do we need to better consider sub-national levels of migration? Thank you for your question. I'll start with the second one, and I'll uh, go then with the first one. So I completely agree. The, the idea of internal migration uh, is a completely uh, different area of, of exploration. Um, it's actually, internal migration is actually more prevalent than international migration, way more prevalent, and especially among the global south. Um, so, and not, uh, as you will say, like you have rural urban, but actually the most uh, prevalent flow is rural rural. So the fact that you have these, these reallocations and that are not necessarily um, as the way we, we are thinking here uh, makes me think that we should separate them. Maybe uh, I, mainly because of the type of selection of migrants. Uh, when you have rural, rural, the, the characteristics of uh, the, the pre-migration characteristics of, the, of these people are way different than the ones that are moving across borders. So that, that could be uh, like international migration. So So in the borders of China, you've got very similar populations. So you've mm -hmm. got people mm -hmm. like the Karen and the Cayenne populations from Myanmar moving into Yunnan. Those would have been autonomous regions. In uh, southern Vietnam, well, northern Vietnam, southern China, you have the Hmong people. So you have quite similar populations. And the borders in some ways have kind of been imposed retrospectively, but it's because the the wage in cities is higher. So the rural Chinese are moving to urban areas to work in households, but because you then don't have enough agricultural laborers, you are getting in cheap agricultural laborers from neighboring countries, which in some ways the preconditions are similar. The only barrier may be language, but because there are also indigenous populations that speak the same language. So where I was, people spoke Dai. Dai overlaps with Thai and Laotian, so it's quite easy for people to uh, actually integrate with local populations in some ways, though they have zero rights, zero healthcare, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. 
So yes, the, this la latter point uh, touches upon the, the conditions post-migration, which are like, uh, I absolutely agree, the fact that uh, like the situations in which many migrants live are not necessarily, they are not necessarily legal and they are not necessarily receiving uh, healthcare and many other benefits. Um, the case of uh, international migration uh, among neighboring areas is a very particular one. Uh, which is different than going uh, from uh, a Latin American country to the US, for example, like longer distances. Uh, the characteristics are, are, are different. And just to give one example, uh, in the case of the climate change and migration literature, it's mostly, um, the relationship holds mostly for internal migration and for bordering uh, states. So people are not gonna move like way farther but just uh, uh, if they go for international migration, it would be to some neighboring country. So I, I, I do agree, but it has like some nuances to be taken into account. Thank you. Question? Uh, thank you for this uh, talk. I have uh, uh, one question is about, is the model dynamic or static? Static. S static uh, yeah. model. This, the second question, is uh, I, I think that the the three uh, variables uh, must be completed uh, by all the variables. For example, the the average wage or the share of wages in the GDP, because it is a very important uh, bring uh, an additional idea about uh, the situation of workers, because it is very important from the point of view of sustainability and from the point of view of the poverty of workers, because it is very important. The second thing, I think that uh, the first, uh, the three uh, quadrants, there is a question of the premium of skilled labor. So uh, you remark that in net destination countries, the, the flows of high skilled workers reduces inequality. That means that the premium of skilled labor in these countries uh, decreases. Mm. This is a good thing for, for uh, workers from developing countries that do flow to uh, developed countries or rich countries. I prefer that because there are some countries of destination of migration that are not developed by, but rich. The same thing for the net sources for the skilled uh, labor increases the premium of skilled labor. In my country, for example, which is a, a, a net source of migration, there is a lot of people that are educated, good educated, they do migrate. That means that the persons that do last, that do remain in the country, their wages increases. That means the increases of inequality. The same thing for low skilled labor in net destination uh, countries inequality increases. That means that there is a lot of people that uh, of low scaled uh, sca uh, that come and the, the, the supply, the supply of unskilled labor increases. That means that the relative scarcity mm -hmm. of skilled labor increases. That means that their salaries will increases. And that means that inequality uh, increases. That I, um, the, the fourth quadrant is uh, I, don't, I don't know how to interpret way inequality in uh, net source for la lo when low scale uh, worker uh, increases, I don't understand. The, the, the last uh, the remark about is the, about what uh, this guy say. I think that in general equilibrium, we have an equilibrium situation and an equilibrium situation and all the adjustment have been done by the elasticity stays and the relative prices between uh, between uh, elements. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So about poverty, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, the, the way in which uh, migrants live uh, can definitely not be generalized. Like there, are, we have like high skill, low skill, but there are also like conditions of uh, poverty, even uh, if, uh, some migrants are high skilled, but do not have the uh, adequate rights, right? So I, I agree that this is a, a, an issue. Um, this could be measured though, 
um, with a, a it, that that could be inferred. And then for the third, for the fourth uh, quadrant, so the net source uh, low skilled, you were mentioning about the reduction in inequality. Is that what you like? How how does it work? So basically, for the net source. Uh, low skilled, uh, less supply of low skilled um, labor uh, increases the, the wage of low, of low skilled labor because of the relative scarcity that, uh, that you will mention. Uh, whereas uh, the op the, we have the opposite direction for the high skilled. So that's how the, the, the reduction in inequality holds in this case. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we should move to the next talk, and uh, I might invite uh, Aisha Dasgupta to join the floor. Um, we have a lot of demography this morning. Um, she is